All right, fantastic. All right, well, hey, welcome everybody. Uh, I appreciate you spending, uh, for a lot of you, your lunch with me. So I know that's always exciting. So I will hopefully uh, give you some thought-provoking things. Um, at the very least, maybe we'll give you pause during your, uh, your snacking hour. So uh, the, uh, the topic uh, of today is, do you have an analytics survival kit? So basically the idea is with, um, and, and it's kind of funny how things evolve, uh, but uh, with recession potentially looming, or if we're not already in one, what do you do about it? What are those um, tool sets and capabilities that you should have in place to kind of contend with rough times? Um, now, what's really interesting is, is I started developing a lot of this content before COVID, and it's really interesting to see how things have kind of uh, checked out, if you will. So you're going to kind of get a before and after discussion of how this came, came to be, uh, and, uh, and, and really we can kind of validate a lot of these, uh, a lot of these theories as we, as we go through it. So let's dive right in. Um, our agenda today, we'll, we'll hear a little bit about me, of course, uh, my company, Grant Thornton. Uh, and then we're going to go right into what are recession indicators, um, talk about most likely and most dangerous um, events and, and actions that could happen, um, talk about uh, methodology that you would then do for recession prep, uh, and that would fall into uh, really three categories of a flexible plan framework, a fast-fail mentality, and how to conduct analytics on all of that. And finally, how do you boil that all into an analytics survival kit? So lots of fun, and we're going to jump right in. So uh, to give you a little bit of background on me, so I'm a senior manager with Grant Thornton, which is a, a professional services firm. So we offer implementation services and such. Um, so I, I, I do all the, uh, the various analytics um, tools there are to include Hyperion. Um, in fact, one of my, uh, my very first tool sets uh, is uh, S-Base and understanding that. Um, but simultaneous to doing, doing that for Grant Thornton, uh, I'm also a Lieutenant Colonel in the Army Reserve. Uh, so uh, my previous position, I, I led US Strategic Command's Big Data Initiative. And I actually now am a commander of a military intelligence battalion for about 500 folks, where we all look at indicators and understanding uh, different impacts and such. So uh, just kind of a different analytic mindset. Um, and uh, the topic that we're actually gonna be discussing today was, uh, was actually derived from an article that I wrote for CFO.com. Um, and so I actually have the link right there under that uh, CFO uh, icon. Um, but basically the, 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 the content of that is um, really the, uh, the high points of this discussion. So it uh, should go well if you wanna read more, uh, that's, that's available. So before I get into the topic, I gotta give the obligatory, hey, my company. Um, so, you know, a, a large firm, I think we're number five. So there's the big four, then us. Uh, and, uh, and so we have a large US presence, but we're also uh, more than US. So we have uh, some, uh, uh, some offices uh, throughout the, the world. Um, so I think we're about 30,000 strong if you count the, uh, the, the, the member firms. Um, and uh, in particular, my group um, is Oracle Practitioners. And so we have all the fun little iconography there of things we've done. Uh, you might, if you, you're looking hard enough, you might see my smiling face in some of these pictures. So now let's dive right in. So what are recession indicators? So let me just give you a little bit of background um, on uh, how we started to approach this. So um, at Grant Thornton, we have a, a council of folks that were brought together that have um, basically all sorts of different talents. Um, you know, so uh, we have our chief economist, um, Diane Swank, if any of you guys watch any of the news program, she's a common uh, figure on uh, CBC, uh, MSNBC, MSN, some alphabet soup of, of different news programs. She's on them. And so she was kind of our, our captain of this. And we brought in folks that were from risk, people that were from tax, people that were uh, analytics. And I was actually the representative from the analytics space. And we all got together and said, hey, what are the things we would worry about for a recession? Bear in mind, this is a year ago. So this is before anyone had ever heard of COVID. And so we started to you know, say, hey, here's the things that were, are, are most um, interesting to us from our vantage point. And here's some things that we'd react to deal with that, right? Because you know, as a professional services firm, we have to be ready for anything because um, we have clients that do all the things. So um, that being said, um, you know, we were definitely wanting to um, kind of cover all of our bases. And we actually put together a pretty nice little survey that um, using our client list of, you know, um, lots of different companies, you know, uh, most notably, we wanted to kind of target in the mid range. So we went from like a 200 million to $5 billion size um, company and, and sent the survey out. And we wanted to ask different things about recession to, to see what their thoughts were about it coming. So this is the findings, and we'll kind of talk about what we do with that. 
And once again, this is before COVID. So first and foremost, we asked uh, it was 250 C-suite level executives, I'm sorry, it was 500 million to 5 billion um, last August. Um, hey, is a recession coming, right? Hey, you know, what's, the, what's that all about? Um, what, what do you think? And pretty much if you, if you aggregate those purple blocks, um, public or private, uh, the, the, light, the light blue, or sorry, the light purple was actually private. I think that got erased. Um, you're going to see that 61 to 62% public or private thought that in the next 18 month, a recession was going to happen before COVID, right? This is like, hey, just economic things going on. Um, triggers we're going to talk about next. Um, but the, the reality is, is most people saw that we were on the precipice, that there was something that was going to push us over the edge uh, because just things, you know, weren't really arrayed correctly. So the idea behind this is, you know, to show like, hey, even if you know, it's not a true recession, you know, maybe the worst hasn't hit yet. Um, most folks kind of saw it coming, right? Because we're in about that 12 to 18 month window right now. Um, so it's just kind of an interesting thought to, to, to see that. Um, and, you know, a lot of the folks on this, on this phone call probably are, are looking at it from a more of an IT lens um, or an analytics lens, maybe a financial lens, um, recognize that your peers are thinking the same thing. These, these, these things are happening. Um, and this is helping to kind of vet the use case, right? If you ever have to say, hey, you know, should we do this tool or should we do that? Like, hey, everyone else is doing it. I'm not saying that's always a good uh, uh, a good explanation, um, you know, uh, on why you should embark on some sort of transformative initiative, but you should recognize that your peers are all in the same boat. And so you don't want to be the last person to decide to use an analytic solution. So that's kind of an interesting um, uh, viewpoint there. So let's get into what's going to trigger it. So I want to point out there's some differences, right, between public and private. So interest rates hikes, uh, in, excuse me, interest rate hikes was a big difference between public and private, um, mostly because I mean think about you know how um, people leverage their companies, um, you know who's who's investing versus not. Um, conversely, uh, availability of credit is a bigger deal for private versus public because they're not doing an IPO. So I mean there's some differences there um, in terms of what would cause recession. Um, but notice there's a lot of things that are different team. Remember, I had my council of, of smart people, which um, luckily they invited me to be in. I, I, you know, um, I was probably the, the least of, of that council. Um, but everyone had different things that they thought could cause a recession. Now, notice nowhere on this list is, is pandemic, right? You know, that wasn't something on our radar. But what you'll notice is how many different things can cause problems, right? Exchange rate, U.S. policy, of having some sort of uncertainty, a labor shortage, climate change, environmental damage, you know, like an Exxon Valdez kind of thing. These are all things that can call, that can cause um, some sort of, 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 of an issue. So it shouldn't surprise folks that the pandemic in fact impacted us in such a way because a lot of things push us to the brink. So once again, recession, it's a big deal. Um, and it, you gotta take it seriously. So, what does that mean? So the, uh, this is where the, the question was then posed to the responder, like, where would you put your investment at that point? You know, to, you know once you know that something's going down, where do you, where do you think it's important to put, put, um, put your dollars to, to kind of contend with, an, with, with some sort of um, recession? And uh, about 70% of, of uh, respondents, that's kind of the private and public combined, uh, came back with digital investments on innovation or technology, right? So the idea is if there's a slowdown, where do you need to put your money at? Now let's talk about why that is. Why would you want to put your money um, to kind of contend, you know, when a recession is? Because most people are like in save mode, right? Shouldn't we just, uh, uh, you know, pocket the money and not worry about it? Well, the reality is, is that when things get tight, and I think we all have seen this uh, during this pandemic, um, you have winners and losers, right? It's not just everyone suffers together, right? You have some people that are making bank, right? You got the Amazons that have gone up twice um, their value, and you have others that are filing for bankruptcy. And the reality is, is that when you have digital investment and the ability to do analytics, it gives you what I would call a tighter turn radius. So think of your business as a giant cruise ship and it's, it's chugging along, right? It's chugging, it's chugging. And something, you know, there's an iceberg coming, right? Are you the Titanic and gonna run right into that thing? Or do you need to start pivoting your business? Well, what's gonna give you the insight and foresight is the ability to see, you know, that iceberg as fast as, as quickly as possible, but also to move your business by having the analytic wherewithal of testing out different theories. And what if we change our marketing strategy to this? What would that do? What if we, um, you know, cut margins by that, by having your tools 
work in that way. It's going to be able to turn the ship faster to get you to a point where you're going to um, have uh, the ability um, to survive and perhaps potentially thrive. That's why investment is important. You want to be able to put into your analytics early so that you're going to be able to respond and turn that ship quicker. Because the folks that don't turn their, tri their, their ship, we're seeing it right now, right? They're, they're the ones that if you don't know how to pivot, guess what? You're going to hit the iceberg. So let's talk about um, this next step is actually something I've, I've learned in, in the military. And, um, and like I said, I have a, a long background, almost 20 years in the military, where I actually do intelligence planning um, at the strategic level. And there's basically two things that you kind of do when you do um, planning of, of, of a large plan. Um, you basically have um, a most likely course of action that you're worried about, right? Like I'm thinking from like bad stuff happening, right? Do you know the 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 the, um, the normal run of the mill bad stuff uh, in the military? I worry about you know, hey, what if there's a um, you know a, a land war, you know, in, in Asia or something? Um, but just the same, you would worry business as usual type stuff for your business. You'd be worrying, hey. Um, maybe we're going to have a new competitor that's going to take market share. Okay. That's kind of likely common stuff. So that's, that's one thing. And then the second one is what I would call the most dangerous, which is your doomsday scenario. Like, okay, we can't have any of our restaurants open because of the pandemic. That's hasn't happened before, but it would be horrible, right? What do we do to pivot? So you have basically your most likely and your most dangerous. And the idea is, is that you should have a toolkit that should be able to kind of monitor and, and, and understand you're, you're really focusing on the one, you know, the normal, but you're also recognizing you'd be able to at least have a, a, a viewpoint on when the other one, the doomsday, comes into play. And how do you counteract that? So the idea is like a Venn diagram. The, the most likely and most dangerous converge and where they overlap, that's where your plan should be. It should be somewhere in that middle section where you're going to be able to uh, handle most likely um, common problems, but your toolkit should also be able to be flexible enough to identify and look at a doomsday scenario. I'll give you an example where this came into play. One of our clients is a dairy provider. Uh, 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 well, they're a large dairy that does all sorts of stuff uh, to include ice cream. And um, not their company, but another company had what, what we would call a doomsday scenario. It was an E. coli outbreak a while back, and several years ago. Um, and long story short, you know, production stops. You have to do a complete recall because people are getting poisoned by their ice cream. Well, that freaked the heck out of our client. And so that's when the shift said, hey, we don't normally track our lots of ice cream this way. How do we do that if we had to? We need an analytic toolkit that allows us to pivot and to shift. It gives you the wide turn radius. Their indicator, you know, if you go back uh, several slides, well, you know, wasn't, you know, not pandemics, not, it's not um, interest rates. It was, hey, um, you know, food outbreak. That's something that was important to them and they needed to have a toolkit that could have been for that. So let's boil this all in. And I can um, take questions and I, I will apologize. It's hard to monitor the chat line when I'm presenting. Um, so Robin, if you see anything that does pop up as a question, let me know. Cause I don't really have good view, a view of that. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, so that's kind of the, the general, hey, this is, this is what's going on. Now let's talk about the methodology. So as mentioned, um, this, is, this is the approach I, I, I've taken and, and advised my clients, and I, I think it's very important that you, you should have an approach. The first one is understanding um, and having a flexible framework. This is where technology comes into play. Now I, I do recognize, you know, um, this is a Hyperion Solutions uh, you know, so I know what Hyperion can and can't do. Um, and I'm, pr I'm pretty well versed on, on, on Hyperion solutions. So recognize, you know, that some of these are more database driven, but Hyperion sits on top of a lot of this stuff, right? It's middleware. Um, so when I tell you about some of these, these, these different pieces, um, recognize your Hyperion solution is going to live on top of what I'm explaining here. So just recognize that I'm not being, um, you know, I'm, I'm not ignoring, you know, hey, you need to rebuild your cube every night kind of thing, but recognize it's more of the, the on the abstract of how you do this. And I can go more into the details as you ask questions. So the first piece on the flexible fr framework is leveraging new technologies to enable, um, uh, uh, empower your knowledge sharing. What do I mean by that? So we use a lot of structured data in, in the business world, and that's fine. And, and that's to do answer our day-to-day -day operations, right? You need that structure. You need to have your dimensionality and your hierarchies, and such. But recognize that dimensionality and hierarchies 
are not very flexible. Okay, they, they can be if you enable what I would call some additional technologies, such as uh, you know I'm levering back to my my days doing big data for the U.S. government. Um, you you got to have kind of a repository of stuff you're not using. Maybe it's not quite clean. Maybe it's not quite there, but it allows you to rapidly um, bring in um, a repository of information, um, you know, using, you know, uh, semi-structure or non-structured coding. So you're talking about your snowflakes, you're talking about uh, your, your, uh, your, um, your data warehouse, or sorry, your data lake, your data uh, reservoirs, that kind of stuff to allow you to bring in data quickly. Because remember, turn radius. If you haven't done that yet, then it's going to be a lot harder to get to it uh, when the going gets tough. So that's the first piece. The second piece is that that's really where this is evolving behind centralized warehouses, right? So your warehouse is kind of shouldn't be the starting point. It should be more of an intermediary point, right? So you're having kind of that, that data lake. Then you can have a centralized warehouse on top of that um, that's going to give you your more refined reports and giving you that structure. Um, but you should also be comfortable and be able to bring things over from your data lake slash data reservoir. This is going to allow things like your, 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 your vault your, your, such, uh, um, to, to allow visual data discovery to, to have that faster turn radius, as I discussed, right? So be a, being able to then have methodology like da visual data discovery to look at that, that stuff that hasn't made in the warehouse and say, okay, this is of interest, this isn't. And be able to kind of sift through it using visual data discovery. Um, I'm, a, I'm an OAC user, but I've also used other tools. Um, these are the tools that you could apply to look at that to kind of get an insight of something that's not quite completely fleshed out. Um, and, and levering your different, you know, your AIs and LPs and, and such to help really boil down that, that data that hasn't really been cleansed or, or fully formulated. It still gives you access and entry point to get directionally correct. I'm not saying you're going to be reporting your financials off of this. This is to basically understand, is this a big problem or a small problem? It's like triage using data. Um, it's more about understanding directionally, are you in the right place at the right time, as opposed to getting it down to the, the dollars and cents. Once you have that, um, you're going to be able to then um, use your different, as I mentioned, your intelligence automation, your, your AI, et cetera, to help refine that piece once you have kind of an insight of, hey, this is the area I want to look at. So once again, these technologies are, are allowing you to more quickly assemble um, your analytics to confront a problem you hadn't anticipated, right? That, that doomsday scenario. This is giving you a wider overlap, being able to handle something that's problematic um, of that Venn diagram. So that's flexible framework. Oh, and finally, um, this is going to give you new capabilities for dyna dynamic situations. Um, so you got to look at the last time we had a, a recession, right? And that was technically 2008. That was the housing crisis, if you all remember. Um, housing rates, right? That was, that was one of those non-recession indicators you wouldn't have thought of, but it, it's there. Um, if you look at where technology was in 2008 compared to where technology is in 2020, we have a lot more capability. We have a lot more that we can do. And that's going to give us more capacity and capability to handle it and give you the, the tighter turn. So let's talk about that, in, in fact. So I have a little graphic here. Of what was out there in 2008 versus what is out there in 2020 or uh, 2020. So um, you know you had your kind of your OTBIs, transactional queries, all that got good stuff. You know that was there, and you had some of the traditional stuff, right? Your your data warehousing and, and your S base queues. Those were all there before, um, and so you had that capability to answer standard questions with standard responses. It gave you the ability to have good reporting and and to have good enterprise reporting but only for the questions you were prepared for. Now, in 2020, we have the visual data discovery piece, right? Which is giving you the ability to go in and look in data that you weren't necessarily cleaning up, you know, that's not necessarily part of your normal, um, your, your, your normal um, run of the mill type of thing. Um, it allows you to rapidly prototype an analytic question with directionally accurate information, recognizing there's gonna be some, some holes here and there. Then you're also going to have the ability to have augmented anal analytics where you have the ability to, you know, to, to okay, let's, let's revise or refine um, our directionally correct data to get more of a correct model. Or, or, or perhaps you just keep it that way and, and allow the AI or ML, uh, uh, machine learning to, to, um, to go into your, um, your, your, your data lake and, and find connections you didn't even think of, right? So it can either help. Um, help with the discovery piece and, and make that less um, um, less manual, or it could also re refine and revise. This is giving you the ability to get smarter faster, and, and to work faster is going to give you the ability to then eventually put that, that 
traditional cap on it, right? So if you have the answer of what's directionally right, then you can then refine, hey, let's have standard enterprise reporting to answer that question. Now my dairy customer is, is looking at lot size and, and lot date of their, of their batch of ice cream, whereas before they weren't. Their tools allow for that now, but before it had to be done with a visual data discovery and kind of um, interrogating things that you wouldn't have necessarily thought to look at. So that's the idea behind the flexible framework, old versus new. I'll take a breath. Robin, anything on the chat line? Take that as a no. We'll keep going. <laughs> so um, let's talk fast fail. Um, so I'm showing you a picture of a light bulb. Um, so why do I show a picture of a light bulb? This is kind of the, the, the concept of when Edison was asked, hey, you, you, you know, you took thousands of, of iterations to try to um, find out the, the light bulb, you know, how to work it, you know, you know the, before he came up with the, the filament method. Um, you know, how do you handle all that kind of failure? And, uh, and he answered, well, I found, you know, thousands of ways not to make a light bulb. I learned a lot of stuff. I, I had good discovery, right? So it wasn't wasted effort. He, he actually was able to learn from his mistakes and help hone and craft his, um, his, his methodology. Okay. That's, that's, that's what we all know is agility and iteration and, and you have an agile approach, right? Um, but, you know, how many people really take that to heart? And so the very, th the very thing that I think that allows um, this, this type of mindset for an analytic toolkit is having the, the thought process of failing fast. What does failing fast really mean? Well, the first thing is, is that you want to have a culture that encourages people to, 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 to fail, but then to recover, right? You don't want to just have... Um, you know, a, a dashboard you build or an S-based cube that you create or a planning application that does things. And, 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 and if it's not right the first time, everyone's going to be mad and it's going to be angry, you know, et cetera, right? You, you don't want to have a culture where there's no failure um, because then you're never going to venture to do anything that's hard. You're going to just do things that are incrementally better because you're going to know you're going to have the success, which is great. But at the end of the day, that does not move the needle. And so by having a culture that's going to encourage the failure and, 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 and thus recover and, and, and iterate, you're going to be able to um, create things and test them out and do proof of concepts to see if that answers the question for the wider, the, sorry, the, the, the more narrow and tighter turn radius, right? Hey, if we want to do some sort of analysis on this dairy um, product um, and we want to build this type of application to do that, um, build the application. It doesn't take long to build applications, the data validations, the, all the other business rules and such, but to actually try something out, it doesn't take a whole lot of effort. Um, and, 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 and to see if you're directionally correct and to whether you should want to dig a little bit deeper. So that's the idea is that you want to have people recognize that you're going to be wrong the first time, but you're going to be incrementally better each time you try it. And that's going to allow you to, to do that. Now, the thing is, is that you don't want to do it slowly. You don't want to do a, a slow fail. Because that is what, you know, it derails everybody. But if you can really quickly throw out a, a design and say, that's not going to work because we tried and, you know, we, you know, you don't want to have something be um, a slow, painful death. You want to say, okay, let's junk it and let's move on to the next. So how does technology help you with that? Well, aren't we lucky that we live in a day now with the cloud? And there are tools out there that allow us to complement and complement this experimentation. So when you have a cloud um, application, it doesn't cost you anything until you turn it on, right? And then it allows you to, to try it out. If you don't like it, you turn it off, and you don't get charged. Um, secondly, if you like it and you don't, you're not committed to that small model, you have the elasticity to grow something. So you know, obviously you want to make sure you do your licensing correct to allow for this. Um, but at the end of the day, you can then grow something very quickly. Um, so you start small and get big. You don't have to start big because you're thinking you know, 10 steps ahead. You can be more exploratory. And, and, you know, just the very nature of software as a service is all about that, you know, once you have it then set up, you, you can then have your mentality there of, okay, now we turn on this, this application and, and we can use it. And when we're not using it, we turn it off. Um, once again, that's allowing people to fail fast without, impl uh, without the ramifications that come with a software implementation failure, which scares the heck out of every one of us. You shouldn't have that mentality anymore. Um, because the tools and the technology allow you to be exper um, experiential. And finally, iterate, right? You want to be able to take that data um, that you learn from your failure and then move on and, and make it better. So that's failing fast. So the final piece is you want to have um, a, also a uh, action based on trends. So this is, okay, I've been talking technology all this time, okay? 
it's not the technology that only provides answers in a problem, right? I put a lot of onus on my analysts, right? Like I said, I have about 500 military intelligence analysts that report up to me and they, nobody know, well, they all know that they don't come to a boss and say, ah, oh, my, my application analytic dashboard was wrong. So that's why my data is wrong. They just know that, it, you know, that they can't blame their tool when they need to have an analytic mindset, right? That, that, that is the, the very first piece is they need to be able to understand their data and explain it um, and, 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 and take the onus on them as the analyst. They should know when things are right or when, when things are wrong. Not taking you know, the responsibility out of technology, but there's gotta be an equal part ownership. There is no such thing as an easy button that's gonna tell you the answer. No matter how many times Oracle tries to tell you that NLP is gonna write the, uh, the, um, the commentary for your planning application, it's not. Okay, it's going to write something and you can check if it's directly correct. And then you as the analyst have a responsibility to then go vet it and write it something that makes a little bit more cogent sense. Um, and that's what I, I'm trying to explain is that you got to have your analysts know what right looks like. And how do you do that in a fast, dynamic situation? You can't just depend on them just to, to, to read the five o'clock news and say, the bar graph tells me that... Um, Data is going up, so you know. So therefore, we're going to um, turn up production. Okay, there needs to be a little bit more to it than just 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 saying what's what's on the chart. There needs to be analysis and basically a recommendation anytime a um, an insight is is put forth. Right. So the difference between what I what I would say is data versus information and information to analytics is is thus. Data becomes information when you put context, right? It's not just a number on a, on a chart, but rather, hey, this number is bigger than last month. Okay, that's now from, gone from data to information. It still is not analysis or analytics. The analyst has to put a recommended action to that piece of contextualized data information to give it you know, some sort of a base. And so this is where my next point is, is they, they, your analyst, if you're an analyst, you um, need to recognize that you need to prepare and recommend action just as rapidly as the technology is allowing you to do that. Um, so there needs to be a, a, a confidence to, to read the bones as you cast the bones and to say, hey, there is a, uh, a problem here. We need to uh, stop production and um, this is the lot that's been problematic based on this expanding cloud of, of, of issues that we've had um, service requests or, or, or whatnot. That's, that's essentially what an analyst's job is, is not just to recite the news, but also to advise uh, and make sure that the, um, the boss, the decision maker, um, is, is not just, um, you know, just left there on their own to make a decision. There needs to be a recommended action. Now, why, what is the final piece of that? Well, is, I'm sorry, there's, there's two pieces. Uh, the first one is um, you can't wait for just one thing to happen as an analyst in this new world, right? Because you're waiting for one anecdotal thing. Um, you know, oh, we didn't have a recall that, we, that came through, or um, we technically haven't had, you know, um, a um, FEMA call in and say this disaster has occurred. Gr granted, you know, you can't wait for just one of those one single, one single thing to flip. Rather, the analyst needs to be able to recognize trend. Like, hey, we are trending. In three months, this is going to happen if this continues to escalate. This is where planning and all those great Hyperion ob you know, objects come into play because it allows you to better forecast and look at trends and look at things across a year-over-year -year basis or month-over-month -month and help decide, you know, hey, when will that ratio turn negative if this continues to occur or, or whatnot? So once again, it's not the detail of some singular action, but rather to have a mindset of looking at the trend and, and to ensure this occurs um, or this doesn't occur. And that's going to advise the analyst on, um, on making a recommendation one way or the other. And this is really the last piece that, you know, as, as a military fo uh, person, um, anytime I put a recommended action to the boss, um, you know, to the general or, or whatnot, um, I have to say, I have this level of confidence that this is going to occur. I don't think I, uh, I've been in corporate America for many, many years, and I don't, I very rarely hear assigned confidence on a projection. I say, hey, it's going to happen or it's not, but they don't say, hey, we have an 80% certainty this is going to occur. If you say that to the boss versus a 40% certainty, they're going to listen to you a little differently. And I think that's one of those things that analysts need to be trained on how to better, um, you know, uh, promote something that is a, um, you know, some sort of analytic that has a recommended action, it's going to help move the needle. And once again, it's all about moving the needle and getting the people to have that faster turn radius. So what does that mean? Um, we're putting a lot, of, a lot of faith into our analysts, right? Because they have all this great technology. Now they're assigning confidence. 
but how do you make sure that the analytics are still good, right? So I, I'm going to give you two calibration exercises that you can do, and I'm going to, these are very, um, I recognize this is a little wordy as I put it in there. So this is a good takeaway, but I'll give you a quick, um, a, a little, um, a little vignette on how this works. So approach one is what we call mixed and cued analysis. And you can read it on your own. But essentially what it is, is that when you see something happen um, on some sort of trend or you see something, it's not the end all, it doesn't confirm it. What it's basically doing is it's either cueing another analysis. So, okay, when this occurs, when, when this type of um, property value goes down, um, we now look at from property value, we're gonna now look at a different metric that might intersect, right? So we're gonna look at, um, okay, that's, that's sales, uh, a value. So we're going to look at retail sales or, 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 or whatever, or, or we could say, um, you know, I did a real estate company, you know, they would look at property values, but then they would actually see volume and velocity of a sale, which is basically how quickly a, um, a property turns over. Okay. It used to, it used to list for 30 days, not list for 60 days. Okay. That's mixing data. So you can say, okay, it's painting a mosaic of essentially what's going on in an area, right? So you're, what you're basically encouraging your analytics to do is, is you're taking all this good information, right? You have that tighter turn radius, um, but you're not just relying on the first indicator to pop. What you're basically saying is what's the next question? So what? Um, so queuing is when you are saying, um, you know, this, then that. Mixing is when you have, hey, we're gonna look at this cross section of data, okay, property values, but then on a separate axis, you're gonna say, okay, property values impact um, our company, um, in one way, but what if we're going to also look at um, the population density? Has that gone up or down, right? Because that's also going to say if this is a trending market or a uh, a market that is actually um, on the, on the deceleration, right? You're, you're you're losing people. People are moving out. That's that's a different metric. But the intersection of those two is giving you an idea of if if your trends make sense. So it's just a way to avoid a pitfall of making the wrong prediction. Um, another way to do it is um, approach two is what I call alternative analysis, where um, I've served on a red team before. Um, uh, and, and what that is, is basically you have one person that's, you know, trying to find out, you know, what the project, you know, we're worrying about revenue. Um, and, that's, and, and that's where the, the, the hypothesis is, our revenue is going up, it's going up, it's going up, what do you do about it? You could secondarily have a different analyst, um, different person have, it, okay, we're not worrying about revenue, we're worrying about bottom line cost. And, and really, you take the two um, uh, different analysts, put them together, and, and really, it's the com combination of their data that's going to help feed the decision cycle. So once again, different ways to calibrate your analysis. It's ultimately there to make sure you're not just making crazy predictions, but rather making things that have um, a well-thought-out um, process that's going to both address, like I said, the most likely and the most dangerous. So let's keep driving here and talk about my survival kit. I will pause for a second. This is methodology, and we're going to get into the more practical. Um, Robin, anything on the chat line? Nope, nothing uh, so far. I feel like the micro machine man, so I, I'm talking a lot. But uh, if you guys have anything, let me know, and I, I can slow it down. So, analytics survival kit. So this is really where this all comes down, right? So remember the, the the framework that we had, right? We had a flexible framework, the ability to fail fast. That's giving you the ability to have good technology fast. Um, and then you're going to have good analysts. They're going to use that good technology and the ability to fill it fast to their advantage, right? That's what this is all building for. So let's talk about 2008 versus 2020. And so this is kind of the, the kind of why, where I want this to resonate. So I'm going to give you a scenario and we're going to talk about how things were and how things can be. So the first one is, uh, so the, the scenario is, um, so recession has struck uh, in the Rust Belt. Okay, so that's that's what's potentially happened. Um, so price or prices are fluctuating. Um, there's product delays um, because you know suppliers can't can't get it right. They don't they're they're failing in that area. Now in 20, um, uh, 2008, right when the housing crisis is going on, um, remember the toolkits that were available. Not much, right? You had your transactional and you had a little bit of analytics that had the kind of pre-built stuff. You didn't have that that fast turn radius. So what could you do then? Well, your analytic options were you could look at profitability adjustments because your tools were already built to look at profitability back then. And you can say, okay, there's delays and there's higher cost of goods sold. So we're basically adjusting numbers that we already had in our, in our engine and boom, we're gonna run an allocation model and this is what our COGS is. Boom, we know what the profitability is. Business as usual, right? That's what we do. That's on the most likely. We can query order fulfillment prices um, and, and look at the impacts and lost revenue, right? So we're gonna go more transactional and we're gonna say, hey, this particular type of data, um, we're gonna lose this swath of invoices because 
um, they are from this location and we can just project that we're not going to have that. So, okay, add them together, sum it up, and it's two million bucks and that's what we lost. And that's all part of the system. Once again, not super flexible, but you got, you're using what you got. Maybe, maybe you decide there is something that you, you want to look at something slightly different, right? But, you know, we want to look at different suppliers, but we don't have them in the system, right? We don't have this, um, the, uh, these details. So we're going to have to get our specs out to IT. Bear in mind, we don't have any of this flexible stuff to build, um, to build it right on, on the fly. And IT is going to have to go and create a new analysis. Um, and they're going to get back in just a few weeks. And hopefully, we're going to be good. Um, hopefully, that the next few weeks are good. And we're going to uh, depend on bullets one and two. Basically, what you're seeing here is that each of these is all built on kind of what you already had, and you're kind of stuck with it, right? You, you kind of this is who you this you, you you go to war with the equipment you have, and that's then this is the idea. We're going to war. Um, and last one is pray, right? Because that's all you got. Now, I'm sure there might be other options that kind of align to the um, you know, hey, the, the you know the standard you know first two phases, which is your um, your, your transactional data as well as your analytic models that already existed. But the reality is, is that's all, to, that's all you're going to have and you better, better hope that works. So let's flash forward, right? We're 2020 now. These are your analytic options uh, to, this, to this point. So you, you, you don't lose anything, right? You got that one, you got that one, and oh, you got a new one here. So now what if you were to, you know, you have all this, you know, your, your data that you were not using in a, in a, in a, in a data lake, you can create some sort of self-service um, and, and, and pull in those extra suppliers, right? We, you know, people that maybe submitted bids that you hadn't used or they're, they're not quite fully formatted in the system, but you have enough data in there, you're gonna be able to, to bring that in pretty fast. Or maybe they can, you know, you can ping an IP, um, uh, API and get more data from, from um, uh, some sort of third-party source that's providing these. It's giving you the ability to, to do that really fast and have an analytic model that's self-service. Okay, that's good. We're using cloud. What if we were going to create different forecast models um, that's going to allow um, you know additional um, insight into degradation, you know, with understanding our production um, over a, a different period of time? That's, that's a little bit different than um, what in was in bullet one, right? Which is your uh, your cost adjustments. What you're basically doing here is you're you're developing a little bit more using kind of like R and, and some AI um, to come up with different models that will help for economic degradation. Okay, once again, using the tools, the technology of today as opposed to yesterday. yesterday. Okay, this is a fun one. Um, you know, back then it was really hard to do geographic plots, right? Um, it just, it wasn't super simple. Um, but now you have the ability to, to have the ge geography plot. Um, this is more analytic side on the, like an OAC or a Tableau. But now you can start seeing, you know, where your clusters are. And that's going to help you visually determine, hey, maybe we want to shift from here to here. And then we could take that impact once we visually look at it and say, hey, um, uh, what's the freight cost um, from going from this farther place to somewhere else? Uh, and will that maybe help um, uh, make up for it, right? Because you're spending less on freight than you would have done with the, the existing supplier. That's a, good, that's a good way of using it. Maybe there's a, a regulatory tariff that we hadn't thought about by going offshore and, um, and we'll contend with it now, right? Before we want to be all American, um, but the reality is what it is. We'll just, we'll take the hit and pay the tariff. Maybe it won't be so bad. Maybe we want to keep on doing additional AI um, um, uh, simulations, as I kind of mentioned before, and, and keep on um, you know, running through impact course of action. Maybe we want to take in, in publicly available uh, information and have product reviews and, and be able to see if that helps determine a new supplier. Also possible. We could use natural agent processing and, and, and use that to help identify through social media and see if there's additional customer perspectives. And so on and so on and so on and keeps on going, right? Um, M&A analysis and more. Why is that important? Okay, so I went through a whole litany of things, and it's because technology is allowing us the capability to do all this fun stuff, as long as it's giving us a fast, fast framework and our ability to, to, um, to, to fail fast and to rotate through and see if any of these work. Maybe the first three didn't work. Um, that's okay. We're going to rotate through them because we have the technology that's built as the, founding, uh, the foundation to allow for it. Okay. What about a, um, you know, the, 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 basic, the, the basic concept is once you have those pieces of data, it's going to allow you to apply the correct kind of mindset um, to, to help survive uh, when there is, in fact, some sort of issue, right? It's going to allow you to have the ability to contend with a recession or some catastrophic event. That's the idea. So that is my 
two cents on this. I have my name. Um, that's my email. I'm also on LinkedIn. And if you're a LinkedIn person, if you hashtag analytics warrior, uh, a lot of my content, um, I, I always hashtag it that. So you can you know, kind of see stuff I've put in the past. So I wanted to leave the last few or four, four or five minutes for any kind of questions or answers or anything that's there. So I'm going to X out of my presentation if I can. And I, I'd love to have any kind of discussion if there, if there is anything. And I got to figure out how to do this. So if anybody has any questions, go ahead and type them in the Q&A Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So I recognize I'm going super fast. I'm going to drink something before I get too far. <laughs> that was a great presentation, really informative. All right, any questions for Jeff? Well, it doesn't look like it. So I guess you were extremely thorough. Oh, wait. Oh, yep, we got a little comment that it was very, very helpful. Oh, good. Well, thank you. Um, I appreciate everybody, um, you know, sitting down and listening. Um, like I said, this is tried and true stuff. Um, everyone, you know, it's just, um, we can get into the details of how you do a lot of it, but you got to have these kind of things in place to allow for um, the ability to have that fast turn radius. And that's really, you know, what the name of the game is. Great. Thank you so much, Jeff. We really appreciate it.